Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Redefine Expectations webinar. Uh, today's, this evening's uh, session will be focused on engineering and innovation in Africa. I'll start by introducing myself briefly. Uh, so I'm Ali McKee. I was a faculty member at ALA and I taught entrepreneurial leadership and creative arts with, with the one and only Mr. Peter. Um, and I, coming out of ALA, I you know, went to Stanford to get my MBA, built a company in the presentation space, trying to help people tell more visual stories at work. Um, and recently sold the company to Google where I now lead uh, the product for Google Slides. So I'll take feature requests after this. Uh, but seriously, uh, I'm so thrilled for the opportunity to be with these incredible, incredible panelists. Uh, my job is, is very easy tonight. I'm just, just going to let them share their stories. Uh, but I'll give a quick, a quick uh, introduction. So our first panelist is Julia Schroda Agudogo. Uh, she's an ALA alumna of class 2011 from Accra, Ghana. She's a woman's health advocate and innovator with a special interest in developing high quality, affordable medical devices for low resource communities. She won first place in the Rice 360 National Undergraduate Global Health Technologies Competition in 2017 for her work in designing and optimizing a novel low cost cervical cancer screening device. She holds a bachelor's of science in biomedical engineering from Duke University, and she's currently pursuing a uh, doctor of medicine degree at Duke as well, all while working as research associate, research associate uh, at the Center for Global Women's Health Technologies. Welcome, Julia. Uh, defects in aircraft and other safety critical structures. He aspires to channel his skills and experience towards the development of electronic biomedical technologies for better healthcare delivery and personal health management. He holds a bachelor's degree from Duke University as well and a master's degree from Stanford and has worked on engineering teams at Microsoft, TDK, and Apple. And finally, I'd like to introduce Spencer Horn, who is the founder of Cloudline, a startup that bridges the infrastructural gap to bring sustainable logistics across, uh, to bring, excuse me, to bring sustainable logistics access to remote communities. In 2020, Cloudline was selected as Fast Company, South Africa's most innovative startup. He's a graduate of ALA's inaugural class and of Harvard College. Uh, this evening, the first half of our, uh, of our program will be dedicated to an interview in which, again, my, my goal is to help these incredible panelists share their stories with you directly. And then the second half of the evening will be focused on Q&A. So encourage you to use the Q&A feature right in Zoom, right in your bottom toolbar, ask questions, uh, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible and also provide contact information if you want to keep the conversation going. Uh, so with that, I would love to, to kick off and, and ask our, our panelists to, to step in. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, Julia, Gift, Spencer, you could go around and share with our audience, you know, I gave, the, I gave the high level version of, you know, the resume version of what you all been working on, but maybe you can give the rapid fire description of kind of what your day to day is like and, um, you know, how you found this passion in the first place. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm currently working on developing a low cost uh, treatment for cervical cancer with ethanol ablation. Um, so that's like my research um, focus. And I'm also in medical school. So um, Duke has a very um, research focused medical school. We kind of slammed the first years into med of med school into one year. And then the second year, which is usually the third year, it's like clinical um, rotations. And then the third year is um, completely um, research focused. So I'm going to be doing almost entirely research um, this year. Um, other things I've worked on, which Ali kind of touched on was um, 
the developing a low cost um, cervical cancer screening tool. Um, so that has been tested in America and Ghana, and we are currently working on um, testing it out in Peru if um, COVID permits um, maybe next year. Um, in terms of how I found um, my passion for engineering or innovation, um, I grew up in a what you could call, I guess, a rough part of um, Accra. So there's a lot of um, socioeconomic disparities and um, most of my neighbors and best friends didn't graduate high school. There was a lot of crime. So I think I found my calling in science because of how I found it as a place of, I guess, truth or um, organization, um, you could say. And then my passion for engineering came when I realized that um, it was a platform to use the sign that I'd learned to um, tackle a lot of the societal challenges I saw growing up. Thanks, Julia. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for the introduction, Dali. Um, so I am working in a field called uh, structural health monitoring. Um, and what that means is that uh, we're basically using uh, electronic technologies and sensors to detect defects uh, and other maintenance issues in large structures. Um, so you could imagine this being useful because it allows you to automate a lot of these processes so you can take people out of the loop uh, and do maintenance more on demand. My specific part is uh, designing the electronics. Uh, so the, these technologies already exist, but then in most cases they're really bulky uh, and we want to be able to deploy them on really critical pieces of infrastructure like airplanes. So that involves making them smaller while still gathering high quality information because if you mess up, people are going to die. So you need to be able to kind of accurately measure the information that you need, but then with very compact sizes. So uh, doing that work involves a combination of uh, electronics work um, and also signal processing, which is the science of uh, basically, once you've gathered this information, how do you process it and draw meaningful insight from it? Uh, in terms of finding my passion for kind of innovation and engineering, I think it's sort of evolved over time. Um, it started from a young age. I just enjoyed working with computers and uh, doing science experiments. And then I think through a combination of mentorship and opportunities that came from uh, ALA, Duke, and then my time here at Stanford, I eventually kind of zoomed in on this problem. Thanks, Gift. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Ali, and thank you for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I currently run Cloudline, um, which seeks to get to uh, remote communities uh, with logistics access. And the way I ended up working on that problem was actually um, in a previous life in the consulting world, I spent a bit of time uh, out in East Africa. Uh, this was towards the end of my, my tenure uh, in that role. Um, and in a non-traditional project, not in the big cities, but out in rural areas where I was struck by the absolute lack of infrastructure and the difficulty uh, in building economies um, in the absence of, of that kind of very basic platform that, that I had taken for granted really, not just uh, while studying in the US, but even um, in the places I called home in South Africa in Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, and I set out from there to try and figure out how we could bring in something that could uh, address that systematic disparity um, and, and give people access uh, to the global economy. Um, I, day to day, I don't get to work as much on the engineering anymore as I as I would like. <laughs> Mostly the the business development and commercial uh, aspects and and all the other the paperwork is required from the chief email officer. Um, but uh, but I first got into into this line or, or got passionate about this type of technology um, as a young child growing up uh, in South Africa. Um, and sort of followed it all the way through and eventually got to study it. I've, I've been fascinated by flying things um, throughout and uh, I'm very excited that I've been able to, uh, to return to that passion and work on it with Cloudline. Thank you so much, Spencer. Uh, so speaking of, of finding that early passion, 
Uh, Julia, you alluded to in an earlier conversation that, you know, as an African student, you just, you have to be a doctor and, and we all, you know, that, that, that pressure is real. Is that why you, why you uh, ended up in the biomedical field? Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what it was like maybe handling uh, potential pressure uh, around that. I think it was definitely um, one of those things that was always in the back of my mind. Um, I think one of the reasons I wanted to come to America to study was because that was at least one step before med school. So I kind of always knew that med school was kind of like the end goal. <laughs> but I figured if I come to America, there'll be like the <laughs> four years of free med stuff and then uh, going into med school. Um, so I think um, I think I over time the societal pressure became my own like personal conviction that this was what um, would help me to impact the biggest I could. Um, in like I guess going back home, why I think. Um, is really needed is the, so someone with the understanding of um, many of the basic um, diseases that still plague Africa, though we know a lot of times we know we don't, we don't even need to do a lot of research. We know like the solutions to a lot of problems, but a lot of it is about training people. So I thought um, being a doctor was a great way for me to have a basic understanding of a lot of the low hanging um, health, um, health um, challenges faced in Africa. Um, and then I was able to incorporate my own personal um, interest in engineering in that path but yes I think I think I still have the the pressure but um it's kind of pressure that is coming from myself too at this point. You also talked about how you know the, the, this balance right of intellectual curiosity pursuing your intellectual curiosity through research um versus uh what were your words um helping the most number of people through by being a practitioner can you share a little bit more about how you, how do you balance those those two poles as you're trying to figure out the impact that you want to have on on the continent? Um. Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I mentioned, I'm currently in med school. I think after I graduated, um, in with my bachelor's in engineering, um, my next step was to take a gap year, um, where I did like um almost exclusively research, um, and. In the following year, I was faced with the challenge of, you know, deciding whether I wanted to continue with a PhD or to do um, medicine. And um, the way I navigated that, um, at least so far, is that I went to Duke, which is, um, as I mentioned, a very research-focused med school. Um, so I was able to figure out that I did want to be a physician, but I want to be like, a physician scientist. So that's something I'm still figuring out how to balance. But um, I'm grateful that I've been able to surround myself with people, with mentors that enable both to happen. Well, I'm sorry, did you kind of froze? Well, I'm sorry, I think my yeah. internet is freezing. You're good. Is it? Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. Excellent. Uh, so on that, on that point of, you know, I think one of the, one of the big goals that all of us have coming out of the, this session was, you know, Ali, we may be having a sound problem. I'm not sure if the other panelists are experiencing it too. Yeah, I can't, I can't hear as well. No? You can hear me now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we're just uh, trying to, to, to say that, you know, one of, the, one of the hardest things about the journey, your journey towards impact is the decisions that come up along the way that are really difficult. Gift, we talked about a decision that you had uh, when you graduated school of, of what you wanted to do next. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about that tough decision and how you, how you solved the problem that you were faced when you had that, uh, that intern, er, that uh, offer from Microsoft? Sure. So, um... Kind of coming up on my senior year, I was looking at, you know, two potential paths. Um, one was uh, kind of continuing um, on with school and going to grad school. Uh, and then the other was entering industry. And uh, it kind of came at an interesting point because um, as many of you will know, like, as you get to the end of college is when you get to the really interesting problems in your sub-discipline. So I was trying to balance, you know, 
further exploration and sort of getting a deep set of expertise and sort of starting a career that would put me on a particular path. So um, very early on in the process, I had an offer from Microsoft uh, to come work for them as a program manager. Um, and choosing that path meant that I'll do less and less of engineering over time. Uh, and it would sort of move more and more to high level things around the engineering. Um, and then the other option was continuing with grad school. The only problem was that I didn't know um, if I was going to be accepted into any schools at that point, where I'll be accepted and who I would study under. Uh, and I had to make the decision with Microsoft by November. Um, you finish applying to grad schools in December. And so um, what I ended up doing was um, I had a good relationship with uh, the recruiter that uh, I was working with at, with, at Microsoft. So we came to a solution where I would come intern for them um, in the summer after my senior year. Um, because at that point, I will know the decisions that I got from the grad schools. Uh, and then I'll be able to assess also this opportunity at a much closer distance and then come to an informed decision at the end of it. So I um, spent the summer with Microsoft uh, working on some very interesting technology around you know, wearables and um, kind of like mobile technology. Uh, and then at the end of that, I decided that I wanted to go to grad school and uh, do some more engineering and then um, sort of be more of a practitioner that way. I love that story because I think that there are so many points along, uh, you know, it, someone's journey where you're faced with these A or B decisions and, you know, it feels like the walls are closing in on you and you've got to pick a path. And um, I love how you just charted a third path that, uh, you know, that solved the, solved the problem. Speaking of charting a third path and creating, turning uh, constraints into opportunities, Spencer, we'd love to hear more about you know, maybe some of the, the, the hard decision to take the leap uh, to, you know, step out and, and go out on your own. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, that decision making process and maybe what was hard about those initial steps? Absolutely, Ali. I, I think you've, you've sort of hit it right on the nose when you say that, that taking the leap is, is certainly, I think, the first really big decision. Um, and there are probably a lot of folks who can relate to the idea of weighing up, continuing on your career path um, versus stepping into an entrepreneurial venture. Uh, in particular, because often we're making those decisions not just for ourselves, um, but you know, <laughs> for, for our families, for broader communities. Um, and, and I think not just in a way that sometimes is characterized as unfair expectation. I think, you know, there's, there's that level that exists with, with everybody. But I think, you know, when we think about personal responsibilities as well. Um, and so I think that's one of the additional layers of challenge that we sometimes face um, here on the continent when, when looking at the decision. And then, of course, uh, if we look at stepping into ventures um, and the, the track record and availability of funding on the continent, um, we aren't necessarily playing in the, the path of least resistance here um, when it comes to, to setting, setting things up and getting um, support. So it is, it is a really big decision. But I think um, I can say without hesitation, one of the things that made that a great deal easier um, was being a part of the community and ecosystem around African Leadership Academy um, because it was so supportive of the, the entrepreneurial path. And I think that's incredibly important, not just from a practical perspective um, in terms of, you know, having access to people who followed this, being able to, to speak to advisors and mentors and tapping into some of that knowledge and support. But I think very importantly, from a mental health perspective, which is something that we don't talk about a lot. Um, and I was able to connect very early on in the journey with peers who were setting out and doing the same and rely on them um, to connect and to remain sane and to commiserate and to celebrate together. Uh, and those were all incredibly important aspects um, when it came to that decision. I'd cap it off with just now having been in it for a while, um, probably the biggest um, 
decision or, or, or one of the most difficult things to do along the path is then focus, um, which I think is, is an incredibly important thing um, for a leadership team in a venture to, to, to drill down on um, and can be difficult when you have a technology that has many different use cases and applications and a lot of excitement around it. Um, but it certainly, I think, is, is very helpful um, and important for, for setting direction and then having speed applied in a consistent direction. One of the things that you mentioned about kind of the, the initial decision making was uh, your decision to build this company on the continent. Uh, and you described it as choosing the path of a little bit more resistance. Uh, in a world where everyone chooses the path of least resistance, uh, can you maybe talk about, you know, why? Why, um, you know, you, you have a very strong network in, in the U.S. and, you know, obviously graduated from Harvard, so you could have started something uh, right out of school here. Um, what what drives you when you're facing that resistance? Yeah, I, this is this is a great question. I think there there's a personal reason for me, and then there's there's a reason related to the the business. And I'll start with the personal reason, um, which is similar to what uh, Julia and Gift have, have already mentioned, um, which goes to me when I sort of think about what I want to spend my time on. Uh, I think about the impact. Um, that I can have uh, with that time spent. Um, and I think it is, it always has been crystal clear to me on my path um, that my ability to have impact is far greater here um, on the continent. The needs are clear. Um, sometimes the path to the solutions are much clearer. The markets are not as saturated. These are, are really pressing problems. Um, and it's it's something I feel I can certainly put my um, my time into. So so that was the the first sort of personal reason when thinking about where I want to be and where I want to do this. Uh, I think the second relates to the business, uh, which is that we view it as a comparative advantage being on the continent and building this type of technology. Um, there are very few others, and to my knowledge, the majority of the well-known players in the space of drone delivery into remote areas have their origins outside of the continent and have brought those solutions here. We have been completely focused on a user-centered design from the start. And when I started this journey and it was you know, just me doing the exploration of everything before we disassembled the team, before we took any money and had any traction, this was literally having conversations um, with folks like uh, World Food Program office in Nairobi, for example, um, and first getting a start there on understanding um, the needs in the area and some of the aerial deliveries that they did. Um, and then moving on to uh, such agencies such as UNICEF. Um, and I think it's been incredibly important that we have that closeness to the problem and have a degree of personal experience um, so that we're much closer to uh, the end users that we want to serve um, and that we have we have access in a way that uh, a startup that that isn't on the continent just might not have and and sometimes these are in uh, seemingly small details but which play a, a major role if we think about design choices that we make it sometimes comes down to knowledge like the availability of fuels in certain countries or the, the, the layout of road networks. Um, whereas I think that when one is stuck in the, in the lab and designing and engineering away in, in isolation, in a vacuum, um, that one can sometimes be optimizing with just the tech in mind. Um, and we've been very, very conscious of that. Great. So, so speaking of, uh, you know, the the pull to to work on the continent, uh, want to pull the, the questions are so good that I I want to pull in a, in a couple now. So, uh, Hatim has a great question for for you, Julia and Gift. He asks, as Africans pursuing advanced degrees abroad, have you had any opportunities to engage with researchers on the continent, and do you have hopes to? 
Um, so with my project, it um, was quite a multidisciplinary project. So it involved a lot of engineering um, and also medicine. So a lot of our collaborators were um, doctors. For example, in Ghana, um, we worked with um, the doctors in um, Rich Hospital and also Kolebu, so one of some of the big hospitals in Ghana. Um, so in that way, we were able to um, engage with researchers as um, collaborators. Um, I think I'd like to do more of that. Um, I think overall, most of our collaborators are people in America. Um, but I think I'm in a unique position. Um, at least I'm hearing from Gift that my lab tends to focus on like low resource settings. So we do have much more of an opportunity to um, collaborate with, um, I guess, researchers in, across Africa, you, you might say, yeah. Great. Um, uh, then in my case, uh, I have reached out. So when I came for the Indaba, the 10-year Indaba in 2018, um, one of the things that I did while I was in Johannesburg was to uh, visit IBM Research uh, and kind of present the work that I was doing to them and start forming relationships um, with that research lab and other initiatives that are happening on the continent. So I haven't gotten to work with them directly, but um, I do know the director there. Uh, and as I'm thinking of next steps, that's one place that I'm looking at. Um, and kind of in a bigger sense, like, you know, what are my hopes in this area? I think, yeah, having opportunities for collaboration on the continent is, I think, one thing that I would like, love to have more of going forward. I think as we grow our research capacity, you know, with more research labs opening, with uh, kind of pe people placing more investment in this area, I think that will become possible. Uh, but so far, I think I've just tried to reach out and sort of get my work out there when I can. Has has COVID impacted, how has COVID impacted your work uh, and kind of the industry as you think about the areas of, of research in particular? Mm -hmm. I guess I can go first on this one as well. So I think um, I was lucky in that early on when COVID initially struck, I was kind of more in a writing phase of my research. So we're working on a journal publication. Um, and so that's work that you can do from anywhere. And uh, actually having the quiet time to be at home and write was very useful. Um, as it progressed, um, I did a couple of things. One was uh, I'm lucky enough to be able to bring a lot of the equipment that I use in the lab home. So I was able to come and run some experiments, do some analysis that you know I had put on the back burner before um, and uh, kind of keep things going that way. And then most recently, um, a lot of universities are starting to put protocols in place to safely do research uh, while also minimizing risk for the pandemic to spread. So um, at Stanford, I think we're in the second stage of this kind of uh, process and I'm able to go back to the lab. I mean, it's limited to one or two people and you have a set number of hours you can do the day, but it's gradually getting back to normal. But I think I was lucky enough to be able to continue working uh, even as the pandemic was going on. And Julia, what about you? Thinking about med school at a time when we're having a global health pandemic, how do you think about the impact that COVID has had on, on your next steps? Um, so I guess in terms of my med school career, we kind of had a couple months where we were working mainly from home to finish up our exams from the year. And then um, I've spent the last, I think we went back in June. Um, so since June till um, the end of August, um, we're back in the hospital. Um, and we're just, you know, following normal COVID um, precautions and things like that. Um, in terms of my research, um, I'm currently working on a newer, um, uh, newer project, um, which is focused on low resource treatments for cervical um, precancers. Um, but with regard to my work on um, cervical cancer screening, there was supposed to be, I guess, study with, um, with testing out the device in Peru that had to be delayed till next year. So that, that wasn't great. Um, but um, for my like, more animal-like studies and things like that, the labs have um, opened up. So um, it's mainly just following precautions and having fewer people in the lab and things like that. So there has been some delays, but um, I think we are coming back to life.
Sorry about that. Uh, Spencer, for, for you, it's slightly, slightly different impact, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I know that COVID has opened up lots of different, um, has closed a lot of different businesses and opened up a lot of different opportunities for others. How do you think about the impacts that COVID has had on, on cloud line, cloud nine in your industry? So uh, overall, I think that uh, we see a tremendous opportunity here because uh, of course, we've already set out with this mission uh, to bring in critical goods into areas they can't, they can't get into by traditional means. Um, and what the outbreak, I think, has taught us across the globe is that we need a new level of preparedness um, for these types of crises. And we need to make sure that we can get in not just treatments, but preventative measures uh, into areas where they are required. Uh, we've actually been working even prior to the outbreak um, specifically on a vaccine carrying platform that has cold chain on board. This is part of some of the work that we've been conducting with UNICEF as an enterprise customer. And it just so happens that if we look at a situation where we need to get out a vaccine for uh, the, the COVID-19 virus, um, that we'd suddenly be looking at more than a 10x increase of the number of people who need to be served by that vaccine. It would no longer just be um, uh, newborn or, 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 or child vaccines. Um, so that, that represents a, a very large opportunity. Of course, just like any business and, and especially a hardware business, I think the supply chain disruptions have been one that, that have been particularly alarming to us. Um, and one of the things that it's meant we've had to do is to look a lot at localizing um, our supply chain uh, and, and making sure that we don't face you know, any issues, uh, both in terms of uh, where supply chains have been disrupted in particular parts of the world, or just in terms of transportation and customs delays. Um, and then actually even internalizing some of the functions that we hadn't planned on doing quite as soon um, as we subsequently have. Uh, so yeah, that's been that's been the change on our side. Overall, do you see those uh, supply chain disruptions as being uh, advantageous to sort of the African markets because it fosters more sort of homegrown industry, or do you see it as a larger, um, you know, a larger constraint? I think we'll have to keep an eye on how things evolve. <laughs> there there yeah. are of course some trade offs. Um, in play. Uh, I think it is on, on that question of do we, should we be trading more internally or, or building up these localized industries? I think there's always the challenge of the cost and the capital cost of getting started versus being able to get completed and finished goods to people at the, at the lowest possible cost. And I think it's in those two different, the sort of supply and demand side of our economies. Um, that those things play out. Um, for us, I think it is exciting to be able to develop the local economies and industries um, for the needs that we require and to work with our suppliers um, for developing um, the particular products that we require. Um, I think it also becomes for many startups a challenge to their business model um, and perhaps having to have some flexibility around the level of assembly versus manufacturing versus, you know, th those, those various steps of production um, mm -hmm. that they engage in. Yep, absolutely. So to, to shift, shift gears a little bit about, you know, kind of back to the, the individual journey and path that each of you have been on, I want to pull a question, another uh, question from Q&A directed to you, Julia. Uh, Rebecca Irakiza asks, I would love to hear, Julia, I would love to hear how and what challenges you met to make it to grad school. The dream of working on finding medicines and ways to prevent diseases on the continent is there, but sometimes there are fears of not reaching the degree of education one needs to start. Um, so um, just to summarize, the question is about um, like challenges I had in terms of being accepted into med school. You, the, the challenges that you met to even make it to, to the starting line of, of grad school, yeah. Okay, um, 
So I think as um, you've probably heard, like getting into med school in America is kind of always something, a point of like, I guess, something people discourage, oops, sorry, discourage a lot of international students from applying to med school um, because it's, it tends to be pretty competitive and that few med schools who accept international students. So I think um, that was definitely that always at the back of my mind in college. Um, even like the college um, med school guidance counselor kept telling me I should try to um, apply to med school in the Caribbean and things like that, or not apply to med school, but apply to like nursing school and things like that if I wanted to apply in America. I think um, what helped me um, to um, pursue the education I am pursuing is, um, I guess, first and foremost, um, I guess something everybody knows that you have to keep your academics, um, I guess, um, <laughs> you have to keep your grades. I think so I think sometimes there's, um, there's some level of idealism um, involved in, um, you know, trying to always explore things and not being afraid of failure and things like that. But I think, unfortunately, the way the world works in terms of academia or like higher education, you, you have to make the grades. So I think that was one thing I had to um, focus on a lot in college. Um, the other thing was making um, good um, mentors and friends. So I think um, getting into a lab that um, focused on issues I cared about was very important because um, essentially to get into, I think, schools of higher education, you have to prove that you deserve to be there and that um, you have something to bring. So you have to craft a story. So I think um, being able to work with other people who have similar um, beliefs as you and having a higher purpose outside of yourself um, that you believe in can be um, very good um, motivating or driving factors to keep you know, going on the marathon that it is to be in grad school. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't hear you again, Ali. I don't know why. Can you hear? Perhaps we can try to go to the Q and A as we as we wait. Ah, uh, oh. uh, yeah, I think yeah. Just tech, I can I can answer I can answer this uh, same question uh, while we're waiting for the audio to come back. Yes. So I think um, I think a similar similar to Julia, really, I think you will find I think sometimes people won't believe in you. They'll tell you, oh, like don't do it, or like uh, you're not quite prepared. And I think um, what I found to be very helpful in this regard was also having really supportive mentors that um, kind of looked out for me when I was crafting this story. And my undergraduate advisor was very big in this regard. She, um, you know, those meetings that you have with your advisor every term when you're trying to decide what classes to take, what activities to participate in, we always had those with uh, kind of a goal in mind, we were thinking about, you know, how does this experience kind of fit into a bigger theme and fall in line with the things that you want to do later. So by the time to apply to grad schools came, um, I had experiences both in research and in other things outside of research that meant that I was ready uh, both to make the application uh, and then also for someone who was looking at it on the other side to see that I was capable of you know, doing the things that I was aspiring to do. So I think mentorship is very big in terms of uh, surmounting those challenges. And I think also building a community of other people who are on the same path. So I had a group of international student friends at Duke because they were facing similar challenges. We were able to navigate those together and to look out for one another. Thanks, Gift. Uh, another theme that's, that's coming up in the Q&A is around funding, because obviously the in innovation comes at a price, right? Um, and you know, I wanna, th there's a question from Tony uh, for Spencer around VCs that you worked with um, and a question from 
and a, a question from uh, Akinola for Julia around finding funding for, for biomedical science innovation and research. Spencer, maybe do you want to start about that process of securing funding for you know, building an innovative startup? Absolutely. Undoubtedly, most uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and aspirant entrepreneurs would see this as, as one of the, the biggest challenges to, to getting started. Um, and I, there are a number of different views on how one should approach this, but I think probably the most valuable thing um, that I learned early on uh, was that one should actually, despite the very pressing need for getting in capital and getting your idea going, um, one should also be discerning. And one should not just be seeking to sell yourself to VCs, funders, etc. But you should be looking for compatibility. You should be looking for an alignment of um, an understanding of what you're building, an understanding of what perhaps the longer term requirements are around the capital that you're taking on, the support that they can provide. Um, you should be as selective of the people funding you as you anticipate they are of the people they're seeking to fund. Um, and that's absolutely crucial because these are really deep relationships that will be with you throughout um, the venture. And, and there are many stories of where that's hurt ventures and founders a great deal. Um, so it's certainly one of the things one should be very careful about um, and very discerning about. And don't be afraid to take the time um, to find the right backers, especially initially. Um, find the supporters and the backers uh, who understand the vision and who really click with you in terms of the execution. Um, in terms of uh, funding um, my research projects, I think um, I work on their lab. So a lot of the funding, like my salary and stuff like that comes from the lab in terms of more specific funding for my projects. Um, apart from like the larger NIH grants and stuff like that from the lab, there are a lot of um, American um, health um, organizations, a lot of them particularly targeting women's cancers and things like that. So um, a lot of my time is spent trying to, you know, craft, bring together evidence that could show that whatever research we are doing could possibly lead to an outcome that's favorable, um, which is always a challenge when you're trying to do things that haven't been um, done before. Um, I would mention that, unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of like all of the funding um, we have in the lab comes from America. So that's one of the things I actually have um, concerns about or worry in terms of being able to translate um, the skills I've learned here or the work I do here to Africa because, um, yeah, I think even though we are targeting low resource communities, unfortunately, just about everything comes from here. And it's hard to convince American donors sometimes that if you're in Africa, you um, they could give they should give you money a lot of times even part of the requirements to applying from the grants is that you are from an american institution um yeah thanks for for that additional insight Hi everyone, um, I am Kalalelo from South Africa. Um, I'm one of the coordinators for the executive speaker seminar that has now turned into the Redefine um, Expectations webinar. Uh, it looks like we have Ali back, so we can continue. Just keeping you all on your toes. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit ironic to have, you know, the the engineering and innovation webinar host based in America having really, really bad internet, but that's why we need all of you to help us solve these problems. Um, great. Okay. So, so to dive back into, to, into some of the, these questions, we've got an anonymous question, which I think a lot of us can probably relate to. A uh, question for anyone who'd like to answer it. In a year that has been less than hopeful, what is something you are feeling very excited about? An idea, a technology, or a ro role model that you'd maybe like to, maybe we go around really quickly and you can sort of share 
answers to that. I think for me, it's been this idea of re-examining things following the, the disruption. Um, and the idea that we're no longer taking all of the systems that we usually do for granted. And people are asking, I think, much deeper questions than usual about what we can do differently, um, about the way that we live and about the way that we live together on the earth, which I think is quite exciting. And then um, I think probably this is not as exciting, like this is not exciting because we asked, uh, I think we're all tired of Zoom by, by now, but kind of looking at the bigger picture, I think the possibilities for remote work coming out of this uh, are very exciting. Um, and uh, I think for some of the questions that we've been like kind of seeing pop it up, up in, in the Q&A around collaboration, around kind of working together, I think this opened up possibilities to work together across the world um, in an even greater way. So um, I think that's one thing that I see as a positive coming out of this. Um, for me, I, I think I struggle with finding positivity in the year, even though <laughs> that's the question, because um, at my, like my father almost died from COVID um, last month. And I think, so sometimes when there's like dialogue about, well, this actually, you know, things you got, this actually might be a good thing for the world. I think sometimes I approach it with some skepticism. Um, but uh, I think one thing that might be hopeful in terms of the global health perspective is that um, people are realizing that you can't allow um, unknown diseases to fester um, in any part of the world. I think when people first heard that there's something going on in Wuhan, everybody was like, oh, well, it's a Chinese problem. Like, it's going to be fine. Just a couple of people will die. Hopefully to, they'll die fast enough so that it doesn't spread. Um, I think that have happened a lot in Africa, for example, with Ebola and things like that. I had relatives who died and I think there was some sort of, you know, hype about it, but it was not nearly enough. Um, so I think what gives me hope is that there might be some new realization that um, anybody could die from things that are happening in any corner of the world um, once a disease comes up. So I guess that's that. So sorry to hear about your dad, and I hope that I hope that he's okay now. Um, and I think that's such a powerful reminder of you know the somber reality of this backdrop right now. Um, makes us grateful for for you know the ALA community, and uh, I personally am very grateful for for each of you, and for I know the the uh, young leaders who are on on this call thinking about how we can solve problems problems like this one that we're facing now as a, as a planet. Um, sort of in that theme, a question came up from uh, Madupe. I've often found that while I'm tackling one problem, I would find many others in the periphery. What other challenges in your respective areas have you all spotted and thought it interesting to potentially tackle? Does your work perhaps lend itself to taking it on as a natural next step? you know, I think is pertinent to your, your uh, current work, if you'd like to answer it that way, or, or even um, COVID as well. I, I can go first and, and mention some things here. Um, I think this is a, this is a great question. One of the, the things that has come up for us just as we've begun to realize the potential of the technology that we're developing um, is a whole new set of, of use cases and applications very often that people bring to us um, once they see what we're working on. Um, and I think that's something that has been quite enlightening for us. We started off from a perspective um, that the potential for doing aerial sensing with our aircraft um, was not necessarily a very good starting point because there are many solutions on the market addressing these needs and it's a potentially already saturated and competitive space. Um, but it's been interesting just to start getting some of the more nuanced applications coming through and people bringing um, their, their, their challenges with some of the existing solutions uh, in that space to us. So it's very exciting to us once we've been able to fully address um, the, the, the current um, 
focus problem area that we're able to move on to some of these uh, new frontiers and tackle those as well. And, and their areas, for example, uh, such as sensing within uh, agriculture uh, for other humanitarian purposes, such as uh, flood and disaster mapping, um, things such as uh, providing connectivity. Uh, so those are all very, very exciting um, opportunities uh, that we can't wait to, uh, to help address. Thanks, Spencer. Then uh, in, in my work, I think we were coming up again, like against tradition. So um, kind of in this problem space of structural health monitoring, traditionally the practitioners were people who were in mechanical engineering and fields that are very adjacent to the large structures that we're working on. Um, and so I think the way that they approached the electrical engineering aspects of it were very sort of direct and you put together the simplest tools that you can bring together. So some of what we've done in my research has been rethinking um, entirely how it's done. Uh, kind of the technical details I don't think would be interesting for this call, but um, yeah, we basically had to reframe the problem. Uh, and then in doing that, we have proved that it works. And we've also come up with our own set of challenges. So like we share, we reframe the problem, but then it takes us longer to make the measurement. Some of these you need to take them real time. And so it's then meant in this new reframe, how do I make the measurements as quick as they are in the traditional way? And that's something that we're eventually getting to. Uh, and so I think I definitely agree. I think you end up having a lot of these spin-off problems. And I think that's where the excitement out of research comes from. Um, and um, we are kind of charting a completely new path uh, and hopefully introducing a new paradigm in how structural health monitoring is done. Great, thank you. Um, Julia, you, do you want to add something quickly? Um, yes, I think my example is uh, acute and fast. I think, um, so with my um, work trying to develop a low cost treatment for cervical pre-cancer, um, because the new um, idea there's definitely a need to have preclinical evidence. So we had to think about animal models and large, large animal models um, to have show some sort of efficacy. And we got a, a lot of interest from the veterinary world. So I think even though we're targeting mainly humans, we found a whole new um, arena of I, I think animal cancers and low cost treatments will actually have a big impact in that regard. Great, thanks. Uh, so, you know, conscious of time, I know we have a few minutes left and uh, to, to, as we start to near close, I'd like to take it back to a topic near and dear to all of us, um, which is ALA. Uh, we have a question around, from an anonymous viewer, it's probably on a lot of our minds. How did ALA help you in starting the motion for your goals? in terms of events and exposure to real world provided by the ALA? Any, ex any things that come to mind? Um, yeah, I, can, I can take this one as well. So um, one of the really cool experiences that I had when I was at ALA was we had this uh, scientific research um, class that was uh, kicked off by Mr. Scudder. Um, so I did that for a year and I think it kind of took me off on a path where I could um, independently use the knowledge that I was learning. Uh, so like when we were doing like A-level math, physics, chemistry, which was a very focused curriculum, but then this taught me to look at problems in the broader world and how people were applying that knowledge. And so that gave me, I think, uh, some skills and confidence that I could take to uh, the undergraduate research labs that I worked in. Um, and then I think over time, um, some of the support has also come in the form of uh, you know, reaching out and asking for advice uh, as you are faced with some of these big decisions along the way. Um, and then also just having people who take an interest in and um, kind of support your work. And then finally, I think opportunities like visiting IBM research like I did uh, when I visited South Africa a couple of years ago also came through the power of the ALA network uh, and people's connections within the network. So it's been very instrumental over the course of my journey. Um, I echo what Gift said. I, I thought um, Mr. Skada's um, research class was excellent. Um, 
And um, it really like put me on the path of figuring out that I could add some agency in um, exploring problems for myself and presenting and things like that. Um, I also thought just the EL curriculum in general is very helpful. Um, I'm in general quite an insecure person, I suppose. Um, so I think learning how to be talking to other people and um, working in teams was very helpful. I think science, you think of science as a very um, somewhat logical field, but there's a, definitely a lot of in, 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 how do you say, emotions, team dynamics, and things like that you have to navigate. So um, it's definitely not a, a very like logical path sometimes. So I think that was very helpful in terms of getting into labs, learning, uh, get, getting um, acquainted with mentors, working with other people in my lab, things like that. And um, I think having early classmates um, to lean on and to hear, like, to share experience with has been very helpful to um, along the way. Yeah. Uh, shall I count the ways? I think <laughs> the, the just to, I would I would second everything that Julia and Gift um, have already said, and certainly I'd start at that point with with the strength of the network and the support from the various stakeholders within it um, is by far the most valuable thing. Uh, but just coincidentally, uh, I was in a call last week reminiscing about uh, two things. The one was uh, an attempt. I think this was in our very first year. Uh, with two classmates of mine to try and build a remotely controlled aircraft uh, way back in 2000 and what was this eight before drones were as mainstream as they are now, which is one really exciting thing, being able to, to tackle those sorts of things at school uh, with the support of one of the faculty. That was um, uh, the second thing um, is the student run business program, uh, which I look back on with great fondness <laughs> and, and was able to be involved in, in two different uh, student run businesses uh, at the time, Rubber Dub Dub and um, Papa Mustafa's Pizza, uh, which we shall, we shall not forget. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think although it was in a, a, a you know, relatively sheltered environment, um, certainly was a precursor in many ways to uh, to what one faces stepping out into the real world and starting a business so so those are very exciting opportunities to have thank you uh, so on that note if you are listening and you would like to have impact like mr scudder or or the countless other um you know ala staffalty who have helped helped uh propel you know, incredible people like like these panelists forward. Um, ALA is actually hiring a new head of science, and you can find the the application link in the chat. Um, and speaking of talent, I know um, you know Spencer mentioned as a entrepreneur is looking for looking for talent, looking for um, sales leads. Would love to close, and we've got about a minute left, so this will have to be rapid fire, but. The power of a network is helping each other. Gift, Julia, Spencer, how can we help you and how can we get in touch with you to help? Okay, um, so in my case, I'm coming to the end of my PhD um, and a lot of the skills that I've built up are transferable. And I think one area that I'm really interested in is biomedical devices um, for improving health. And so I think if people have ideas, people have kind of openings that they know of uh, that would fall in line with sort of like an electronic skill set in that area, I'll be interested. And um, I guess we can share my email details after this call. Great. Um, I'm on the medicine path of school for a thousand years, so I probably wouldn't be um, going to leave um, to go back to Africa anytime soon right now, but I would like to in the future and I'd love to have mentors or examples of people who've been able to do that, particularly physicians, scientists um, who've been able to translate their work. Um, same as gift email, would be great to reach me. I think you said it, Ali. For me, it's, it's talent for any of you who are within the network or know folks in the network um, working in this area of engineering. Uh, please send them my way. We're always looking for great people. Um, and the second thing is if in your country, you know of initiatives that could uh, make use of our service or you're connected uh, either to governments or other entities who are interested, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to get in touch. 
And with that, we're at time. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to each of our panelists. A round of applause. Uh, this is, it's been an honor and a privilege to facilitate y'all telling your stories. And so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you so much. Um, tonight, I want to turn away a little bit uh, from simply just thanking you all for being here tonight and take it a little bit of a step further. Uh, being African myself, living in an African country, and indeed having family members who still live under very poor conditions that could greatly benefit from all of your research, projects, and innovation has me not only appreciating um, the hour that you've given to us today, but the countless number of hours that you have dedicated to moving this continent forward. Um, by having your work ultimately benefit the people of this beautiful, beautiful continent, and so on to offer not only a vote of thanks um, to our panelists, to you, um, Ali, but also just words of encouragement to keep uh, pushing, to keep on redefining what you may believe is expected of you, um, to keep being selfless and, and sharing yourself um, to the world, and at the same time, just giving more of the brilliance that we've all had the privilege of witnessing tonight. Um, the ALA family is a good family, and that has been evident today. And so I believe that because of people like you, um, our future will be that much better. Um, it's a little bit of a sentimental note, especially with the fact that we're speaking on um, engineering and innovation. Um, but uh, tonight's discussions um, have really just impacted us all in doing exactly what the series has been to do, having us in our own ways redefine what we believe um, is expected and can be done by the youth on this continent. Um, stories like tonight um, of our brilliant panelists um, could not be possible or would not be possible most probably if we didn't have um, storytellers. So that's exactly what the next webinar will be on in the next couple of weeks. So I do thank everybody who has attended tonight um, and that our next webinar will be taking place uh, speaking to more of ALA's young alumni um, on storytelling through film. So please take a look and have a look at our Eventbrite pages as well as our social media spaces um, on how to register for that. Ali, Spencer, Julia, Gift, thank you again so much for your time. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye.